Good morning. As we get started today, we'll first have opening remarks from Daniel Pipes, to be followed by five panels, and then we'll have our dinner this evening with Todd Bensman and Ellie Abrams. First, I want to have a few points of recognition. We're joined by Scott Rosenblum, the chairman of the Middle East Forum, Richard Irving, uh, vice chair, <laughs> members of our executive committee, and members of our national board. Uh, Larry Holland, I just saw walk in. Larry Holland, our treasurer. Hey, missed you. <laughs> and I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Daniel Pipes, a historian, is the president of the Middle East Forum. A former official in the U.S. Departments of State and Defense, he taught at the University of Chicago, Harvard, Pepperdine, and at the U.S. Naval War College. Daniel has written 16 books. He also has a new book, a 18th book, I think, that will be coming out in June about Israel victory. This is a funny story, and I'll have Daniel come up here, and it sort of shows you how the fast-paced nature of the organization that he founded in Leeds has to sometimes call audibles in the light of global circumstance. Daniel had submitted his Israel Victory book on October 1st of 2023, and the publisher sent it back on October 8th and said, you might have to make some changes to this. <laughs> but I think you're, you will all be delighted to read his latest work in June. Without further ado, Daniel Pipes will discuss the Middle East Forum at 30, a reflection on the past 30 years. Thank you, Greg, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This talk is somewhat under duress. Um, Greg insisted that I talk about the Forum at 30, so uh, I will indulge myself and talk about the Forum at 30. And uh, the title is Middle East Forum at 30 and the Next Three Decades. So this provides me with a perfect excuse to uh, reflect and uh, predict. So this introduction has five parts. I'll begin by offering perspective why I founded it 30 years ago. The major changes have taken place, our focus on strategy as opposed to advocacy some note of our successes, and finally, a few words about looking ahead. So the founding. When we opened doors in January 1994, during a particularly brutal winter, some of you may remember, our first board meeting was a brownout because the ice had gelled the coal in Philadelphia, so it couldn't produce electricity. So we had a brownout. Uh, we consisted, really, of just one activity, the Middle East Quarterly. The forum was an abstraction, and I was its editor. In the first issue, I asked why this journal at this time aren't there already many quarterlies that specialize in the Middle East, and my answer was there are indeed, but their outlook differs in fundamental ways from ours. First, none of them look at the region explicitly from the viewpoint of American interests. Secondly, they reject to varying degrees the views of most Americans and the enduring policies of the U.S. government through a dozen administrations. Many even laud and sympathize with the states and organizations hostile to the United States. In contrast, the Middle East Forum supports strong ties with Israel and other democracies as they emerge in the region, urges strong measures to eradicate terrorism and control both conventional and unconventional arms proliferation, works for human rights throughout the region, seeks a stable supply and a low price of oil and gas, and promotes the peaceful settlement of regional and international disputes. Pretty plain vanilla, no? We shorten this to the slogan, promoting American interests and protecting Western values. Sadly, as recent events have shown, specialists on the Middle East and Islamism are even more antagonistic today to American interests and Western values than their elders were in 1994. For that reason, I submit the Middle East Forum is more necessary than ever. At this rate, it will be even more needed in the future. Secondly, to look at developments, and there have been a lot, a lot has changed. First, the internet. Um, 
It's transformed fundamentally how we research, organize, and communicate. Our website, meforum.org, which will be overhauled in a month, uh, symbolizes this change. I think back to the early days and how our mass mailings involved the copy machine, sheets of paper, envelopes, stamps, and then culminating in a run to the post office. <laughs> it just seems like a medieval practice at this point. Uh, in this context, I'd like to mention Thelma Prosser, who's not with us today, but she is, besides me, the only empl other employee still around from back in 1994, and who's been running the office for all that time. Secondly, the failure of Middle Eastern studies, as uh, Martin Kramer subtitled his book, compelled us to create Campus Watch, under the longtime supervision of Winfield Myers, it monitors, critiques, and battles our university counterparts. The professoriate's response to Campus Watch has been as extreme as its politics. My favorite response was by a professor who goes by the name of Miriam Cook, which is a perfectly ordinary name, except she uses minuscule letters. She's small m Miriam and small c Cook of Duke University. And she captured the spirit of the antagonism in 2005 when she declared that the warriors of Campus Watch, her term, are, quote, are already changing the rules of the game, not only in Middle East studies, but also in the US university as a whole. As I like to say, there's no compliment so sincere as a backhanded compliment. <laughs> it's, I think, giving us a bit more credit than we deserve, but still, I'll take it. Thirdly, the evolution of Islamism, from mostly a violent movement to a mostly law-abiding one, has been uh, a, a sea change for us. This has challenged us to argue that this more subtle menace holds greater dangers than the more obvious criminality. This is not intuitive, and yet I think over time, more and more of our audience has come to see this. Uh, Sam Westrop has taken our Islamist Watch project into new directions with his deeply researched and original, and sometimes shocking, reports. I suggest you take a look at his pistachio report. Surprise to all of us. Uh, fourth, the mass migration of Middle Easterners to the West added a completely new topic to our portfolio. We began just foreign policy. Now we do a lot of domestic policy. This eventually led to the founding of Focus on Western Islamism, a publication edited by Dexter Van Zyl. We see it primarily as a source of news, not analysis. We have analysis too, but news, news, hard news, making up for the scandalous dereliction by the major media. Fifth, a massive frustration with the so-called peace process and the emergence of the Israel Victory Project, led by Alex Selsky and Ashley Perry, uh, has become yet more central after October 7th. And yet it's a strange time, because on the one hand, victory is talked about incessantly. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has talked about it by my reckoning, and I'm not following everything he says, over 50 times in the past half year, every couple of days. But yet it's further away than ever in some sense. And as Greg mentioned, my book, Israel Victory, with the subtitle, How Zionists Win Acceptance and Palestinians Get Liberated, will be published in a month. I hope you find the subtitle intriguing. How Zionists Win Acceptance and How Palestinians Get Liberated. Sixth, we now have an investigative operation, thanks to Greg Roman with both intelligence and legal aspects, ranging from revealing corruption by the Qataris in the World Cup to bringing a lawsuit against the organizers against the current spate of anti-Semitic events on American campuses. This is the area where we don't tell everything we know. A little bit shadowy. Seventh, an awareness that the only way to push back on the Iranian menace is through uh, regime change, we recently founded an Iran Freedom Project that calls for regime overthrow. Uh, strikingly, we noticed that nobody else is doing this, so we thought, okay, let's do it. We have only begun this project, which is led by Jonathan Spire and Jim Hansen, 
so expect to hear more about it soon. We need to translate eighth, uh, these projects into public policy, which led to the creation of what we now, what we used to call the Washington Project, now we call Middle East Forum Action, which is led by Benjamin Baird. Later in this talk, I'll give a few examples of our successes. Ninth, a growing need to publish op-ed length analyses, not just the research pieces in the Middle East Quarterly, and the creation of the just found Middle East Forum Observer, edited by Michael Rubin, provides us with a platform to present brief research and analysis that complements the quarterly. And finally, 10th, the litigiousness of our opponents inspired us to create the legal project. It was specifically the uh, Boston case, the Islamic Center of Boston, that prompted this, I think, in 2007 where we fund and uh, provide advice to those who are being sued for their discussion of Islam, Islamism, and related topics. I'm happy to report that this problem is now in abeyance, due in part to our success. And so the legal project is in, uh, on hold. We're not really active there anymore. Uh, my next topic concerns the general approach that I've tried to instill, that I take personally and try to instill in the forum, which is to provide strategic counsel as opposed to advocacy or apologetics. To understand what this means, it's best to look at the Arab-Israeli conflict, which attracts particularly intense attention and vehement views, but the same applies to Islamism, the Erdogan regime in Turkey, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and so forth. Advocates fill the news pages and airwaves with passionate statements of justification and condemnation. Their work involves morality. Which of the combatants acts with justice, which evilly? Advocates win this argument and shape public opinion, and that in turn influences government policies. But morality and justice are not the only important debate. Another one more specialized, concerns strategy. Not who is right and wrong, but how to win. The latter debate focuses on an assessment of forces and offers idea on how to advance one's goals. The strategist takes the goals for granted, such as a secure Israel, and focuses on how to achieve them. And mind you, the audiences are different. The advocates are focused on those who don't really know what they think come over to our side. The strategist addresses primarily people who agree and says this is how we want to act. And in part, uh, my reason for not wanting to do advocacy is because in many of these areas, and particularly the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, basically everybody has a point of view. Uh, there are very few out there who don't know what they think. So yeah, it's important. It's good debate, but not ours. Advocacy, advocacy and strategy each have their role. The advocate speaks of rights and wrongs. The strategist deals with success and failure. Passion marks the former. Ice runs in the latter's veins. One engages in media criticism, the other in criticism of his own side. The advocate would choke on presenting the adversary's point of view, but the strategist routinely does this, for example, in war games. I have... Uh, written articles in which I imagine myself the strategist of the Islamists and try to figure out what I would advise as a way to figure out on how to counter them. Advocates seek to convince the undecided. Strategists seek to guide those who agree. The Middle East Forum primarily focuses on strategic activities, which I think makes the best use of our expertise. Uh, fourth point about our successes. Um, I think there have been a number. Uh, it's slightly embarrassing to lay claim to them, but I'll go ahead. And this is under duress, as I stated in the beginning. I think one of the most important was the understanding of Islamism, the ideology as a phenomenon distinct from Islam, the religion. So complete has this breakthrough been over the past 25 years that it strains the imagination to remember what it was like pre-9-11 
when nearly all Americans perceived an undifferentiated Islam as the topic. I think this has happened and a very important uh, breakthrough to understand that Islamism is an ism in the sense that communism and fascism, socialism are isms. Jumping to the present, I'd like to mention a few recent uh, successes. Working with Iranian activists, we won the suspension, i.e. firing, of a certain Mohammad Jafar Mahalati, a former Iranian regime official responsible for covering up crimes against humanity. He had been the professor of peace, that's what he was called, at Oberlin, University, Oberlin College, and now he's gone. We didn't do this alone, but we did this with Iranian, Iranian allies. Um, Secondly, a nationwide effort, we've engaged in a nationwide effort to persuade hotel chains to stop hosting Islamist groups with connections to US designated terrorists. So it's not their views, it's their activities. Uh, we're now at an IHG hotel. I don't think we've had any success with IHG, but Marriott has been uh, the biggest, has been, um, uh, uh, has listened to us. For example, earlier this year, we canceled two events in um, Fort Lauderdale, one to be hosted by the South Florida Muslim Federation and the other by the Islamic Circle of North America. We also engage in other kinds of pressure. For example, the um, CARE, CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations fundraiser gala in Philadelphia was to have been addressed by Representative Summer Lee member of the squad, and she pulled out. So we take some credit for that. We played a lead role in the passage recently, just some weeks ago, of Maryland House Bill 763, a law to remove care from a commission on hate crimes, response, and prevention. We worked with the bill's supporters, sponsors, testified at hearings, arranged for speakers, mobilized local activists, and the legislation is on its way. I think it's impressive that we have worked with the staff at Fidelity Investments. All of you have heard of Fidelity. I'm not sure you're aware that it has five trillion with a T on, uh, in assets under management and 13 trillion with a T in assets under administration. Uh, it's one of the big three. Uh, working with the staff of its donor assisted fund or DAF, we succeeded so far, and we expect to have more, uh, two Islamist organizations, again, tied to designated terrorist groups as beneficiaries, namely the American Muslims from Palestine and Rahma Worldwide Relief and Development. This means not that Fidelity is funding them, but if you park your money at Fidelity, you cannot give. They're not listed. You can't give to them. And finally, uh, we've en engaged in a divest from Qatar campaign that resulted in 25,000 emails delivered to a couple dozen CEOs of American top equity and hedge fund firms doing business with Qatar. The campaign's been discussed in the Washington Post and elsewhere. Uh, we are still assessing the results. Finally, looking ahead, uh, the next 30 years, it's kind of bold. Uh, the Middle East, I believe, is doomed to remain the world's most volatile region due to the enduring power of anti-modernist forces, the religious passions, the abundance of hydrocarbons, the geographic centrality of the region. In short, our work will not soon be done. The region hosts discouraging problems from uh, that fester without end from dictatorships, Islamist movements, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and weapons proliferation. But there are also some signs of hope. Islamism, in my analysis, peaked a decade ago. Not here in the West, but there in the Muslim-majority countries, especially in the Middle East, and is in relative decline. Iranians are sick of the Islamic Republic. The Arab states have largely removed themselves from the conflict with Israel. What I call civilizationalism, or the pride in Western civilization, is slowly gaining numbers and strength throughout the West, especially in Europe. This last point has special personal interest, 
having just finished this book on Israel victory and enjoyed the experience, I now ponder writing another book, still thinking about it, not sure, not committed, but the working title is The New Europe, Muslim Immigrants and Western Civilizationalists. In conclusion, a word of gratitude to our thousands of generous donors, far-sighted individuals who have made our work possible. Speaking on behalf of the entire staff, we are <laughs> conscious each day of our good fortune to have your trust and support. We feel privileged to be doing the work at hand, work that is a passion for all of us. I'd like to, well, I was going to sing, single out the executive board, but Greg just did, so thank you to all of you who are here. It's been my honor and pleasure to start the discussion today. I'd like to close by congratulating the staff who conceptualized and organized this event. Greg Roman, Marilyn Stern, Matt Bennett, Nikki Ellis, and especially Susanna Johnston and Liron Yadin. Uh, you probably know how much work goes into such an event. I express my gratitude to them and look forward to the day ahead. I'm delighted to see a new generation forwarding the work that MEF began in 1994. The staff has a greater range of skills and connections than I ever had, and it also has an energy I admire as shown by this conference, our second of many to come. Located at great distances from each other, we only come together in person at these conferences. Overwhelmingly, we communicate via electronics. I particularly enjoy the palpable sense of excitement as we text each other about issues, issues of the day. The staff's capabilities, dedication, and hard work give me confidence that the organization will remain at the forefront of strategic thinking and policy influence concerning the Middle East and Islamism. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Daniel? Sure. Uh, Daniel, Michael Brazil, the foreign policy research institute, was uh, one of your colleagues at one time. How important do you think his work was in identifying the impact of uh, Muslim immigration to the West? Uh, the the topic of Muslim immigration really emerged with the Rushdie affair in 1989. It had been as obscure as, say, Hindu immigration. It just wasn't a topic. And then suddenly it became topic number one. Um, and there were a group of us who awoke to this fact. Uh, Stephen Emerson would be a name. Um, Bacha Orr would be another. Uh, Michael Radu, as you noted, would be a third. Uh, and what we did through the 90s was basically a spade work for what followed after 2001, after 9-11. Um, we gained the skills and developed the connections that then were important after 9-11. Questions about the size of the Muslim population in the United States. Uh, Pre-9-11, there were fantastic figures. And even President Obama mentioned 7 million. But there were 10, 12 million figures. Uh, then, of course, we don't have a census with the religious question. So it has to be done through inference. Uh, the general consensus is that the Muslim population is about 1% of the American population, so three and a bit million, of which about a quarter are um, Americans who converted, mostly um, African Americans, and three quarters are immigrants and their descendants. Um, 
the percentage is much smaller than in most European countries, where it goes as, excluding Russia, which has a native pop, Muslim population, um, uh, France probably has the highest, you know, of 10%, 12%. Uh, so w we tend, because of the smaller population, because it's more educated, uh, we tend to follow Europe. Europe is where the action is. We are following. Are you uh, concerned about threats to this organization? For example, legal threats or even security threats? Threats to the Middle East Forum, uh, legal and otherwise. Uh, following 9-11, I, I wrote an odd article, I think a month later, uh, with a title along the lines of this, why this American feels more secure. Uh, because suddenly everybody else was worried about the same things I was. It felt very lonely before that. And I, I was even thinking about moving my house because I was feeling so, the focus of an organization like CARE was unrelentingly on Emerson and me. Uh, felt, felt very queasy. Um, but since then, two things have happened. First, there are far more people involved. And secondly, uh, many take a far more radical, they're anti-Islam, we're not anti-Islam, we're anti-Islamism. Uh, so the spotlight is off us. And while we have a lot of security, uh, you may have noticed, uh, I'll just say the, the address that we emblazon is not our real address. <laughs> um, the state where you think you're calling is not the state <laughs> where <we're laughs> the telephone is. Uh, so uh, we have um, lots of security, but um, we have not had any actual threats. Legal, uh, there's noise, um, but um, there was an incident in 2004 5 where a very tiny organization, a one man organization called Anti Care, headed by a fellow named Andrew Whitehead, um, engaged in all sorts of anti-care activities, and CARE brought a lawsuit against them. And he was represented pro bono by someone from Greenberg Traurig, a major Washington-based uh, law firm. And CARE discovered, I believe, in the course of this litigation, that there's something called discovery. And it didn't like that. We have nothing to hide. They've got plenty to hide. <laughs> so they don't go after us. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I did write it out, as you may have noticed, so yes, I'll be happy to make it available. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks so much.